Welcome to Fire Engineering Training Minutes. I'm Nick Martin, and today we're going to talk about some forcible entry tips for a tight hallway scenario. Not every time we force a door do we have the opportunity to be outside on the front lawn of the house in the sunshine with plenty of room to work. Sometimes we're going to find ourselves in a tight condition where we're going to have to modify our techniques to overcome uh, some different challenges. So with that, let's go inside and take a look. Okay, so we're inside here and we have a couple things set up uh, that are going to create some obstacles for us. First, we have a near shoulder width hallway, right? And later, when we have two firefighters in here in full PPE and SCBA, this is going to become an issue as we try and work around each other and also work with the tools. We're going to have to make sure we manage our bodies appropriately so that we're effective and that we don't uh, dislodge the tools as, as we work to for force the door. Also, as we come down the steps here, we have uh, three steps going down towards the door and that's going to cause a change in height for us. So one of our firefighters is going to be down here, uh, a couple feet below the other firefighter, and that's just going to change our dynamic between the Halligan firefighter and the striking firefighter as we work on the door, and again, have to work on managing our bodies. At the bottom of the stairs here, we have a metal on metal door, metal frame, metal door, inward opening with a couple of good locks on it. It's a good solid door, and it's going to give us a decent challenge, so we're going to have to make sure that we have uh, good, te good technique as we work. Keep in mind also that in a real fire environment, this area that we're working in may have smoke down to the floor. So in addition to our tight space and changes in height, we're going to have to manage a zero or, no, or low visibility environment and make sure that we're working coordinated, that we're working with practice so that we can not only effectively force the door, but we can do so without hurting one another. Okay, so now we have my partner, Danny Doyle, in here and we're going to talk about some of the steps we're going to go through kind of at low speed and then we'll do a couple full scenarios and you can see that we're in here in our turnout gear and we don't even have SCBA on two average side firefighters it already starts to get a little bit tight so you know as we get into the full scenarios we put our bottles on things are just going to get a little bit tighter on us so we come up to our door here and as I come down the steps we're going to start off with just our standard inward opening forcible entry technique we use the shock gap set force method. So I'm going to come up and I'm going to go size up my door, locate my locks, decide my initial plan, and I'm going to go first and shock the door. That's going to help loosen up the door, help me identify any locking devices that I might not have seen from the outside, and it gets me a purchase point where I can now easily come in and get ready to gap my door. Now one of the things we're going to have here, if you have this hallway, butting right up against the edge of the door is you can see that it's real easy for the edge of my tool to be rubbing up against the edge of the, of, of the wall here. And that can provide some friction or tend to dislodge the tool if we don't manage it well. So we need to make sure that when I get the tip of my ads in there, I pull out enough on the bar so that I'm not rubbing up against the wall too much. Always remember when we're doing this, this inside hand is constantly pushing towards the frame to make sure we keep that tip of the ads in there. It's only in there like a quarter inch or so. So we need to make sure we keep it in there as we work down. Another thing to keep in mind, this door opens in and to the left. So in this scenario, we're going to gap downwards so that our pike doesn't hit the door and dislodge the ads. But if this door were to open the other direction in and to the right, just picture that then I'd be in a position where I had to gap up. Now, depending on the height of my tool, if I went to set that ads, say here, and had to gap up, look what would happen with my body because of these steps. I'd be in a real bad spot to get good leverage, right? Whereas if I'm here, look how I can put my body, put my shoulders right under the tool and get a much fuller, fuller strength gap as I just stand up and extend my arm. So back over here though, fortunately I can use my body weight in this scenario and I'm going to go ahead to get my gap. Now one of the things you have to have really in all forcible entry scenarios, but definitely in this limited space, is we have to already know the game plan. So Danny already knows that when I go for this gap, if I'm able to get a wide enough gap that it's worth capturing, he's going to use the blade of this axe to capture that progress, which will reduce the number of additional steps we have to do. So let's see what we get as we go and gap this here. So here I go for a little bit of a gap, and this is not really a gap that's worth capturing. Danny, if you want to just try and slide the, uh, slide the axe in there to try and capture it, if we can see that the gap that I have here does not allow the blade of the axe to go both past the leading edge of the door and the back of the door frame. With this not going past the leading edge and to the back of the door frame, if I relax pressure on the bar to reposition it, there's a good chance that this axe is just going to kick out. If we compare that to, if I can get just a bit of a better gap, 
So here I got a good gap. So if I call for that wedge, now I'm past both the leading edge of the door frame and the back, or the leading edge of the door and the back of the door frame. And it's in on both sides. When I relax this bar, it's gonna, it's gonna sit instead of kicking out. And if you look at the body position while we're here, how Danny had to come in. Danny, if you come in here like you had to gap it again, I gotta make room for him and he's gotta know where I'm gonna be. Picture a no visibility environment. We got our bottles on, we're on air. This is a tight spot. If we haven't trained and talked about this in advance, we're gonna be tripping all over each other and we're gonna be ineffective and we're gonna take a lot longer than we need to. So I got a good gap there, I got it wedged. Now when I relax, that wedge holds my progress. Notice the door doesn't kick close on me. With the wedge in there, the gap that I've created is gonna stay for me. And now one option I have is I could try to immediately go to setting the forks, but I don't really have a really good depth there. And with this ax, I can come in and I can drive it a little bit. So I'm gonna take my ax, notice how Danny instinctively knows he's gotta back up a little bit, give me some room. And I drive that ax in, I can go as deep as I feel I need to, but you can see that that gap widens up, which makes placing my halogen bar a lot easier, all right? So now I've got my bar, I'm gonna take the tension off and Danny's gonna come, have to come in around me to recover his ax. One of the main problems we may have in a confined space forcible entry environment is our ability to strike the head of the tool. Traditionally, when we set the fork of a halogen, we strike the head of the halogen, right? Now in this scenario here, Danny could try and come up where I am and I could be where he is and he could strike the head, but in a limited visibility environment, that, that change in body height might make his swings less effective. In addition, if we have, say, a newer firefighter or a little bit less practice or we're not totally coordinated, if I'm in front of him and he's swinging away wildly with an eight-pound ax and he misses, that's coming right on me. So we have two techniques here that we can use to strike the shoulders of the halogen. Now, if you look at the shoulders of, these, of this halogen here, you can see that they're squared off. Many stock halogen bars come with a more rounded surface, and you'll see that if we had a rounded surface here, as we strike the shoulders and the techniques we're going to use, that rounded surface would cause the axe to glance right off. So two techniques that we can use are chopping and sliding the, and sliding the axe. So if we go to slide the axe first, that's basically where Danny is going to take his axe and he's going to use the length of the bar as a guide and he's going to slide the axe down. Go ahead and give us some hits, Danny. Hit, 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 stop. All right, so basically the advantage of that is that there's a, you know, the shaft is the guide and as you come down the shaft, you're always going to hit onto the shoulders. But Danny, if you place it right up there at the shoulders, you can see that a couple problems come on. Is number one, because of the angle of the bar versus the angle of the axe, we don't get a, a total uh, surface to surface contact there, we don't get maximum force delivery. Also, as the shoulders come past the edge of the door, come past the door stop, there's a good chance, especially in a limited visibility environment, that we end up hitting the door frame and not the shoulders. All right. Another thing that comes up often in a firehouse debate is having grips or not having grips on your halogen bar. You can see this halogen bar has a small grip on it and that that ribbed surface would prevent Danny from, say, starting up here and coming smoothly all the way down the shaft. So that's one option for setting the tool and you can see there it will set it well. Another option though is to basically, I call it the chop technique. Danny's going to position himself down low here. He's going to use his low shoulder and he's just going to strike that low shoulder. Go give, give a couple hits, Danny. Hit, 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 stop. So we can see that that offers a couple advantages. Number one, if we're in a low visibility environment, Danny's eyes are right on his target. Maybe he's got a light on his helmet or something like that, but he's looking right at the ax and right at the shoulder of that halogen. So he's got a, a good ability to line up on his target. Of course, if he completely misses with a full swing, I'm not in front of him. He just hits the door. Nobody gets hurt, right? The other thing is that if you look at Danny's body mechanics as he moves in on that, here he can get a full shoulder delivery using the full force of his upper body to slide in on that. And also because of the vertical positioning of the ax head rather than being parallel to the ground, it's less likely that he's going to hit the doorstop than hit the shoulder. So let's go ahead and finish setting to our proper depth. You see that by getting a good gap and wedging that and using that axe blade to widen it, we, we only need maybe one or two more hits here to get into the depth we want to be. Give me a couple hits, Danny. Hit, 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 stop. And you can see that gets some good delivery. It's setting the fork. Now, is that going to deliver nearly as much force as hitting the head with a full good, full good swing? No, but we're not in an ideal environment. We need to be able to recover. So now that I'm in there, now I'm going to communicate to Danny that I'm ready to force. With Danny, we're going to force it. So he knows he's got to come out. 
and I'm gonna come in and across, right? So Danny steps out behind me. I get my position here and I'm ready to force in across the door. We work in. Our rule of threes, it doesn't go after three good tries. I'm gonna hold the bar as, far, as hard as I can against the door to maintain maximum gap. Danny already knows from practice and communication that I want him to wedge it. I reposition. Notice he's got a duck back out of my way as I come in with my ads, going from zero degrees of leverage back to 90. I take the force off the door, give Danny a chance to get the ax out, and now I can crush down again, pulling that lock out of its keeper, come up, back across to force the door, and as the door goes in, reach around with the head of my halogen, pull the door closed to control the door. I can let my bar slide down now, and now this gives me an opportunity to size up the conditions behind the door, make sure if we didn't already have our masks on, we got the masks on, or call for water in the line or whatever, but it protects us from the environment on the other side until we're ready to go. All right, Dan, we got a door opens in to the left. I'm gonna shock it. All right, Danny, see if you can wedge that. All right, I got it. I'm gonna drive it. Coming in behind. Right, I'm beveled to the door, see if you can get that back out. seen here is that it's mostly our standard inward opening door technique, our shock gap set force. All we've had to do is modify a few of those steps to accommodate this, this tight space, our steps, our change in height, and perhaps some lower zero visibility. But I think what you see in addition to the little tips is that the primary thing is the practice and coordinated teamwork between the two members. If this isn't something that you've talked about, that you've planned for, that you've set your tools up by say squaring the shoulders for, it's not going to be able to be something that you're going to pull off in the hallway when it smokes down to the floor and you're at the fire door. So we need to make sure that we have our plan together, we need to make sure that we're practiced, and that we're operating like a well-oiled machine. Thank you to our sponsor, Globe Manufacturing. I'm Nick Martin, and thanks for watching Fire Engineering Training Minutes.